If you love God, say amen. amen. Love God, say amen again. It is a blessing once more and again for God giving us his privilege to come together for the purpose of learning more about his holy and his engrafted word. I know many that may be watching this broadcast maybe right now wishing that you could be um, in the fellowship with the believers um, this morning. But because of the current climate that we're living in and the current situation that we have going on, it's just not possible. But wherever you are, whoever you are, I can say right now you too can be glad and you can celebrate because not only did Christ die, but right early Sunday morning, he got up with all power in his hand. And I'm so glad that I serve a God and I have a faith that I don't just have to wait until one Sunday out of April every year to thank God for him getting up, but I thank God every day of my life. Every Sunday that we come together is Resurrection Sunday, am I right about it? Because he didn't just get up on this Sunday, he got up every Sunday. He get up every day of our life and we thank God for this privilege. We thank God for this opportunity that he has blessed us with. So in spite of what we are experiencing right now, never forget the fact that because he lives, we can face tomorrow. And if God had power over death, hell, and the grave, surely he can have power over COVID-19. And I'm going to write about it. Surely he can have power over that. He said in his word, where two or three are gathered together in his name, that he would be in the midst of them. And we thank God that wherever two or three, maybe you in your home right now and you and your family are enjoying the worship services, just know wherever you're gathered together in his name, touching and agreeing on anything, he said that he is there in the midst of you. So I would like, as you've already heard our scripture reading for this morning, to call to your attention the book of Hebrews chapter number 2. And we're going to read verses 1 through 4 for our consideration um, on this morning. The grass withers and the flower thereof shall fade away, but the word of God shall stand forever. And if by chance you are not a member here at the Sweetwater Church of Christ and you're watching this uh, via live stream this morning, we just want to thank you for tuning in with us on this morning. And I pray particularly for you that you would play, have, listen with an a honest ear and an honest heart because I would have you to know that the word of God is powerful. But it can only do something for you if you have an honest heart. So I pray that you will listen, um, attention, have your attention clear on this morning that you might hear um, what it is that the Lord is trying to say to us this morning. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. And the Bible reads this way. Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we also drift away. For if the word spoken through angels proves steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him, God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Spirit according to his own will." I want to give for a message, for a thought for us to consider this morning, oh so great a salvation. Oh so great a salvation. This verse this morning that we have read for our hearing stresses to us how important it is that we pay close attention to what we have been taught by the scriptures. Because if we don't pay close attention to what we have been taught by the scriptures, we can drift away from what we have been taught. Even now during this time where you're not able to convene and assemble with the saints, it's important that you pay close attention to what you have learned and what you have been taught in the word because if you don't continuously feed yourself the word of God, you will find yourself becoming weaker and weaker than you were before than what you started out. Now the same thing happens if you neglect the word of God. Y'all have heard the saying say if you don't use it, then after a while you're going to lose it. I don't care if you have a skill, if you have a talent at doing something. You can be the best person it is that can do it, but if you go years and years without practicing that skill, after a while you have to tune your skills up in order for you to get back to that place where you were. And neglecting the word of God is the same way. You'll find yourself at first, you remember what the word of the Lord said. 
but after a while, things will start getting a little fuzzy to you, and after a while, you'll no longer remember what the word of the Lord has said, and you won't be able to recall the word of God and his scripture, and that is when we find ourselves drifting farther and farther away from the path of God. Now, These verses make a comparison between the old law and the new law of Christ. And he points out how the law that was spoken by angels or messengers was steadfast or trustworthy because what was said came from God and those who broke that law received a just penalty. Now, since that law or teaching was true, the new law that was first taught by Jesus should be considered even more trustworthy because Jesus Jesus is the Son of God. Now, if under the law of Moses, one could not escape the wrath of God, what makes us think that we can escape the wrath of God under the new law that has been given by his Son, which was proven by miracles, signs, and wonders? Now, the answer is there would be no escape. So we need to take heed to the warning and not neglect the word of God or we'll find ourselves drifting away. But Why is salvation so great? Why is it that on this Easter Sunday when you could have been up there preaching about he got up and he got up right early Sunday morning, why is it that you choose to talk about why so great a salvation? First, I would have you to know that salvation is great because it came at a high cost. Now, salvation to us is a free gift. But it costs our Lord his very life. We know the scripture, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now, I don't know about y'all, but that's real love that's being exemplified right there. There was a story that comes to my mind of a little girl that needed a kidney transplant. And they put a little girl on the list, and they was caught looking around, and there was nobody that was fit to give the girl a kidney except her little brother. And so they came to the little boy and they asked him about giving the kidney to his sister. And he thought about it for a minute and he didn't say, yeah, I'll give him my kidney. And as the doctors were rolling them back there into the operating room, the little boy looked at the doctor and said, how long before I die? The little boy had agreed to give his sister his kidney thinking that his life was going to be taken in the place of it. Now, the only only other example I can look at that is how our Lord selflessly gave himself in the place of us. We weren't no good. We weren't doing everything right. We we weren't meeting up the part. We weren't perfect, but still, God saw us on the auction block of sin, and he met us in our mess. He met you in your stupor. He met you in your sin. Wherever you were, God came, and he met the difference in your life. That's real love right there. Scripture lets us know greater love have no man than this, that a man will lay down his life for his friend. I don't know about y'all, but ain't too many people I can say I lay my life down for. But this man selfishly, and think about it, he gave his life at a chance that you might love him back. It it wasn't the fact that everybody, well, God going to die for the world and the the world is going to love him back. We know that Jesus, by a lot of people in the world, is hated by the world. But still, he gave his life that we might have the chance at everlasting life. Now, if you have children, I just want you to think about how hard it would be for you to just give them up. Just give them up willfully for the sacrifice of mankind at the chance at having salvation. We need to keep in mind that only a few will actually take advantage of salvation. Would you be willing to do it? Well, God has given us his only begotten son. And scripture lets us know in the book of Romans chapter 5, beginning at verse number 6, for when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. That's that's me, and that's you right there talking about the ungodly. That's us right here. And for scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But the scripture says that God demonstrated his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, I know you thought you was all there in the bag of chips and God just came along and decided to bless you anyhow. But he said that while we were yet sinners, 
Christ died for us. And God loved us enough that he was willing to purchase our salvation with the blood of his son. And he did this knowing that Jesus would be rejected by his own people. And he even knew that he would be tortured to death. And while most people would never give up their child for sinners, God did. And this is one reason that salvation is so great because God does not owe us nothing. God don't owe you anything. And we don't deserve any of his love. We don't deserve any of his grace. But guess what? He just gives it to us anyhow. Ain't that a good God? Why wouldn't you serve him? Why won't you be faithful unto him? If somebody is continuously being that good and that good to you, surely you can return thanks and praise God for what he has done in your life. Now, Jesus also did this for us willingly. He left the riches of his heavenly home, to become poor so that we might be rich. Not only did he bring about a new covenant for all people, but he also, according to Acts 20 and 28, purchased the church with his own blood. Now, the church, which is described as his body, is important to Christ. And he will only save those who choose to be a part of his body because according to Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 23, that he is the Savior of the body. And another reason salvation is so great is because Jesus is the author of it. Now, I don't know if you were just driving down the street and you saw some buildings that had been built up and it said this one had been built by this man and this one had been built by that man. And you get to the next one and said this one was built by Jesus. Now, I don't know about you, but I'll be trying to get in the building where it said that it had been built by Jesus. I want to be on a ship that it said it's being driven by Jesus. Because as long as Jesus is the captain, as long as he is the author, the starter, or whatever it is that you're doing, you're going to reach your destination and you're going to be all right as long as you stay in the hand of God. Now, The scriptures lets us know, according to Hebrews chapter 5, beginning at verse number 8, it says that though he were a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the what? Author of eternal salvation to all them that obey him. Now, the reason that it is so great that Jesus is the author of eternal salvation is because he understands us. God ain't guessing about your troubles. He knows about your troubles. He understands your struggles, and he knows what it feels like, listen, to be tempted and tried. He understands why we fail to do what is right sometimes because he has lived our life. According to Hebrews chapter 4, beginning at verse number 14, see him then that we have not a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God. Let us what? Hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was at all points tempted as we are, only difference is, He did it without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we might obtain mercy and find grace to help us in the time of our need. Now, even though Jesus never gave in to sin, he can relate to us. And this makes him the best author of our eternal salvation. Now, we can know with confidence that he will be fair with us when it comes to our weaknesses. And he will know the best way to help us. Now, knowing that Jesus is in our corner should give us confidence and and that's why I can stand here this morning with a smile on my face and I I don't have many worries going on in my mind because as long as Jesus is in my corner I'm not worried about what the devil may say what the devil might do the Bible says that no weapon formed against her shall be able to pry he didn't say it went far he just said that it would not prosper you've already heard it said many times this morning that all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord. If you love God, if you are faithful to him, if you are doing everything according to his will, things may not always feel good, but at the end of it, they're all going to work out for the good. Joseph, I'm worried, shouldn't sit in prison, man. How this going to work out for my good? My brothers have betrayed me, sold me into slavery. Potiphar's lust-filled wife that lied on me. How is this going to work out for my good? Not knowing that God had a plan all the while to 
bring him out of the situation that he was going through. God got a way and God got a plan. Now, whenever we choose to embrace the salvation that God offers through his son, we get to have this wonderful avenue of prayer of where we can pray to God. I don't know about y'all, but I'm glad to have the avenue of prayer. Any of y'all ever had to call up God late in the midnight hour? And, uh, you don't just have to wait till the midnight hour. Have you ever, when you open your eyes up in the morning, you just had to call and say, Lord, have mercy on me. You know, because you know, I, don't, I don't know, but I, I've heard about it. You know, you get on up uh, after a certain age and you get up in the morning and all you hear is snap, crackle, and pop, and you don't see no Rice Krispies. And you got pain here and you got pain there and you have to say, just, Lord, have have mercy when you get up on the side of the bed and just have to sit there for a minute and let everything get connected with this and everything will get right. God has a plan. He understands our weaknesses. I thank God for the avenue of prayer because there are just some things, certain things, y'all know it to be true, that we go through in this life that you can't talk to nobody else but God. And the good thing about talking to God about our problems is that you ain't got to worry about nobody else hearing about it. Y'all already know what it's like to talk to some people. You go and you tell them about this and you tell them about that. And before you know it, Clay County, Duval County, know about what you got going on. But when you go to Jesus, you got somebody that you can confide in. You got somebody that you can hide in. You got somebody that you can depend on when you're depending on Jesus. Now, and, and, and we ought to bring God not some of our troubles. We ought to bring God all of our troubles. You know, we, in the have, we just want to bring God some things, those things that we feel come, well, God, you can have this, but I'm still going to hold on to that. God desires for his children, his people, to not just bring some things to him. God wants you to bring it all at his feet, and he wants you to lay it down. Now, now Jesus is the author of our faith. Hebrews chapter 12, beginning at verse 1, says, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside what? Every weight and the sin that does so easily ensnare us, and let us run with patience the race that has been set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author of and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before us endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set back down at the right hand of God. Jesus is our example, and he showed us that it is possible to stay steadfast in your faith. It's possible to stay steadfast in your faith. Why, 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 why? I wish we could be perfect like Jesus. It just ain't going to happen like that. We cannot, but if we want to enjoy the great salvation that has been given to us by Jesus' obedience to God's will, then we got to learn to be obedient. What, what did the Bible say that obedience is what? Better than a lot of us want to sacrifice. We just don't, we, we just don't want to be obedient. We just don't want to do what God has commanded us to do. Y'all ever seen people that seem like they just want to take a chance, like they just, just want to take a risk? It's just like you have that parent that, that tells you, well, don't do this and don't do that. And they're only telling you don't do it because they've already did it. They've already done it. And they know what's coming around the bend. So they're just trying to warn you of some things that are coming up so you don't have to experience it. But you already know. Some people just have to learn some things on their own. Some people, it's necessary for them to bump their head. It's necessary for them to stub their toe so that they will be able to learn. Some folk learn from the school of hard knocks. Everybody don't learn from you just sitting there and telling them, amen, don't do this and don't do that. Some people have to experience it. And anybody here that's ever experienced a trouble in your life and you've ever had to use that avenue of prayer and say, hey, God, I don't know what's going on. I done got myself in a mess. I need you to show up. I need you to come and help me. You, you know and you can attest to the fact that he will be there right on time. Now, we can look toward Jesus and the example that he has left for us to give us strength when we need to break free from our sin. Now, Paul, Paul gives us his attitude in Philippians chapter 4, famous scripture, Philippians chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. He said, I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, he said, I have learned, listen, to be full 
And I also know how to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. But then he said, I can do all things through Christ that gives me the strength. Now, so salvation is great because when we have it, Jesus will be there to give us power over sin. Another reason salvation is great is because it takes away our sin. This is why Jesus gave his life for us. This is why everybody across this world right now is celebrating right now because Jesus gave his life. So that we could have our sins removed and that we might also in the process be reconciled back unto God. Now, one of the first things that Jesus commanded his disciples to do after he was raised from the dead was in the Great Commission. We know it, Matthew chapter 28, beginning at verse number 18. And Jesus came and spoke to them saying that, oh, not some. He said, oh, authority has been given to me in heaven and in earth. Go therefore and make the disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have taught you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16, and he said unto them, go into all the world and preach to every creature, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he who does not believe shall be be condemned. That, that sounds pretty clear right there, right? You need an interpreter. You need somebody to come along and explain it to you any further. That's clear. That's straight. No chaser. God's word is as it is. So Jesus did not die for us so that salvation would be limited to just a few people, but that we should take our salvation and keep it to ourselves. But he desires men everywhere to be saved. I'm glad that you ain't just got to be high yellow to be saved. You ain't got to come from the right side of the tracks to be saved. You ain't got to have a master's or a doctorate to be saved. You ain't got to have this or that to be saved. You ain't got to hang out with this or that person to be saved. But he said, whosoever will, let him come. Jesus commands us to take the good news of salvation to the world so that they may learn about what Jesus has done for us. And so they might have the opportunity to embrace this salvation. Now, Jesus' apostles, they didn't did not disobey this command. We know because we find them in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, gathered together as Jesus had told them. And on that day, the Holy Spirit was poured out on them just as Jesus promised that it would. And that great noise that was heard drew thousands of people to them. And then the 12 apostles stood up and proclaimed Jesus' death, his burial, and his resurrection as they spoke in different languages by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, this did not impress some of them. Because as they were speaking in these different languages, some thought they were speaking gibberish. Man, them, they, they, they went, they wine biblers. Them men, they up there drunk. They didn't, get, they didn't got a little tips. That's the only reason they talking like that. But Peter assured that they were not drunk, seeing as it was but 9 o'clock in the morning. And when he finished preaching, many of those gathered said that they were pricked to the heart and they realized what they had done to the Messiah and they asked the question. Acts chapter 2 and verse number 37. It said, now when they heard this, they were pricked to the heart. They were cut to the heart. You know the word of God will cut you, right? You know, you can be doing wrong. You can be on the wrong side of the track. That's why a lot of folk just don't like the truth. Because the truth will correct you. The truth will put you in your place. The truth will bring you to the realization that, hey, I'm not doing all that I'm supposed to do. Y'all know sometimes you can't say amen. Sometimes you just got to say Ouch. He asked Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Now notice that question was asked to all the apostles. And they wanted to know what they had to do. Now, I wish more people today would get to the point in their life where when it comes to salvation, they would ask questions. Ask questions. Don't just take somebody's word for you. You're playing with not just your life. You're playing with your eternal life. 
We ought to ask questions when it comes to our salvation. Now, notice his response. Then Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sin. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all that are for all, as many as the Lord your God will call. And with many of the words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, save yourselves from this untoward generation, and then those that gladly receive received the word, were baptized. And that day was added to the church about 3,000 souls. Now, these people already believed that Jesus was the Son of God and that he died for them and that he was raised from the dead. But more than belief was necessary for salvation. Peter lets them know that they must repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of their sin and that they will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, the only other step not specifically mentioned here is confessing Jesus Christ as Lord, which is commanded in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. Now, if a person wants to have this great salvation, that has been given to us through the sacrifice of Jesus, that we must obey the word of God as Jesus did. Now, if we love him and if we consider him as our friend, then we got to obey him. Now, all these commands must be followed in order to have salvation, and you can't separate. God's commands are not a buffet. Meaning you can't pick and choose, well, I want these and I want that one. Maybe I don't want that. I'm going to put that back. You got to take it as it is. If you do not believe, repent, confess, and are not baptized, then all you have done is gotten wet because you have not followed the instructions of the author of our salvation. Out of the thousands of people that were gathered on that day, about 3,000 of them accepted what they heard. And they were baptized and they were added to them, which means that they were added to the church. Their baptism did not add them to a denomination or a man-made institution. They were added to the church that Jesus bought and paid for with his blood, and they were added to the church, as God says in Acts chapter 2 and verse number 47. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Now, once again, Paul makes it clear that baptism is the point where it happens. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse number 13, he said, for, one, for by one spirit were you all baptized into one body. I've already mentioned that Jesus is the Savior of the body in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 23. So it stands to reason that if we want to have the great salvation that God has offered us, then you got to be in the church. And the final command that he puts you in the church, or we could say the body of Christ, is baptism. When you read through the book of Acts, you find that the disciples of Christ spread the good news of Jesus all over the world and they all taught the same thing peter one preaching one thing and paul preaching another barnabas one preaching one thing and simon preaching another but these person didn't have that they were all preaching the same thing lord i wonder what happened do you know what two commands are always emphasized in the conversion in acts number one is belief and number two is baptism. Belief and baptism. Peter said it right in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 21. There, there is also an antitype which now saves us. Baptism, which is not the removal of the fifth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ our Lord. I can say a whole lot about this topic, but I've said what you need to hear in order that if you have an honest heart, you can know what God's word teaches plainly that if you want to obtain salvation, you must love Jesus enough to obey his word, which includes believing that he is the son of God, repenting of your sins, and confessing him as your Lord, which includes believing and repent. And yes, we must be baptized for the remission of our sins before God adds us into his church that will save us. Now, another great thing about salvation, as I stated earlier, 
it's available to everybody. Everybody. Anybody who desires salvation has the opportunity to receive salvation. Now, God wants everybody to be saved, and he desires for everybody to come to the knowledge of the truth. You recall in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men call slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. First Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 3, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, Calvinism teaches that some people are destined to be saved, meaning that before you ever came into this world, it was already decided whether or not you was going to be saved or whether or not you was going to be lost. But, but that teaching contradicts the scripture we just read because our God does not operate that way. Peter figured it out when he was told to go to the Gentiles for the first time. He came to the conclusion in Acts chapter 10, verses 34 and 45. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, I perceive that God is no respecter of person. But in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. How do I work righteousness? By doing what God has commanded. So nobody can say that salvation is not meant for them, which is why salvation is so great. And the last reason I want to give today of why salvation is great is because it gives us hope. It gives us hope. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3, blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with what? Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Now, when you obey the gospel and when you are baptized into Christ, you receive all spiritual blessings that are found in him. And one of those spiritual blessings is hope. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 27 says it this way. To them God will to make known what are the riches of his glory of the mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. When you are in Christ, you have the hope of a heavenly home with God for an eternity. When times get rough and bad things are happening all around us or to us, we can cling to the hope. That salvation has been given to us. This is the attitude that Paul had in Romans chapter 8, beginning at verse number 18. He said, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly awaits for the revealing of the Son of God. In other places, he tells us to keep pressing on to our goal of getting to heaven. I do want to point out that once we have salvation, you can choose to lose it. I know they told you that once you were saved, you was always saved, but I came to give you a news flash that ain't rightfully so. Scripture lets us know that he that endured unto the end shall be saved. Ain't no such thing as once you became a Christian. You, so a lot of us think that we're going to use our baptismal certificate at the train station when they come. Hey Amen. I was baptized. I'm supposed to have a seat on this train. It don't work like that. You got to live it out. You got to walk it out. It's not just a one-time thing. You pick up your cross. You got to pick up your cross every day of your life. You got to deny yourself every day of your life and you got to follow Jesus. No matter how hard times get, you got to follow Jesus. Other folk going to leave the church. You stay with God. Amen. You stick with Jesus. And after a while, you'll reach your destination. You'll reach that place. If, we, if all we had to do was obey the gospel and get baptized into the church, then why is the New Testament filled with warnings about falling away? If all you had to do was get baptized, then why does it let us know that you can, in fact, fall away? And why do the writers encourage us to fight the good fight of faith and keep sound doctrine and walk in the light if there is no chance for us to lose our salvation? Jesus made it clear in Revelation chapter 2 and verse number 10. Be thou faithful and you shall receive a crown 
of life that will never fade away. Now, don't be fooled. You can lose your salvation if you choose to. And as we come to this, I, I, I would have you to know that salvation is great because it has been offered to us as a free gift. I'm so glad that God has not put a monetary price on salvation. I'm so glad that God has not put a moralistic price on salvation. Because truth be told, we wouldn't be able to earn either. But God has given us a free gift. And whoever desires that gift, it is available unto them. He lets us know, therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things that we have heard unless we drift away. And if you're watching this live this morning, you're watching this broadcast, I would have you to know that if you have been neglecting to put God's word first place in your life, then I want to encourage you to start taking time out of your life, study the word of God so that you don't find yourself drifting away from God because you will not be able to escape the wrath of God that is due us. I don't care who you are. I don't care how old, how young you are, guess what? We must all stand before the judgment bar of Christ to give an account of the things that we have done in this body, those things good, those things bad, red, yellow, black, white, whoever you are, you got to stand before God. Even the judges of this world got to stand before that judge one day and give an account of the things that they have done. Now, if you hear this this morning, and you have not become a child of God, I have shown you from the Word of God what is necessary for salvation. You go back and fact check every scripture that I gave you. You can find those things are necessary for your salvation. I cannot force you to believe it. You can choose whether you're going to listen to God's Word or whether you're going to listen to somebody else. So if you are ready to embrace that great salvation that Jesus has, has offered you by believing in him, by repenting, by confessing him as your Lord, and by being baptized in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, you need to act on that today. No matter who you are, you may be watching this right now. You might not be in a church. Go ahead and inbox us. Go ahead and call us. I'm sure I can find somebody to get in contact with today that can make sure you touch some water. Because guess what? Who knows what tomorrow is going to bring? Who knows what next week is going to bring? And and, and I'm sure enough, Corona scared you enough by now. You know you need to be trying to get just a little bit closer to Jesus. And I would have you to know we are only saved today by the blood of Jesus Christ. Ain't no other way to be saved other than by the blood. There's power in the blood of Jesus. Am I right about it? Only the blood can transform a nobody into a somebody. As Matthew here tell you that the blood can change a tax collector into a missionary for Jesus Christ. As Peter here tell you that the blood can take you off the fish pond and put you out there making you a fisher of men. As Paul and he'll tell you that the blood can take you from being a a persecutor to preach in the gospel the blood got power to change your very situation Esther will tell you that only the blood of the lamb can take a lowly Jewish girl and make her the queen of Persia that's what the blood can do the blood transforms our despair into a never dying hope and that's why the songwriter declared my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All of the ground is sinking sand. Some may say it was my education that gave me a chance in life, but I disagree because I know it was the blood. Some may think their hard work brought them this far, but I disagree because I know it was the blood. Some may envision themselves as the source of their own good fortune, but I disagree because I know it was the blood. There are some things in this world that we cannot attain without the blood. There's a fountain from which you cannot drink, but the power of his blood brings you to that fountain. And we are cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Salvation has been offered, y'all. We sing the song, salvation has been brought down. Go and shout and tell it to the world around that salvation has been brought down. So the message today for us is clear. That because of, 
what Jesus did on the cross in the giving of his life and his sacrifice. Because of his death, we now have the opportunity to be saved. In order for a new covenant to come into effect, in order for it to be ratified, there has to be the shedding of innocent blood. There was nobody that was found worthy to pay that price. So it was the reason that Christ came into the world to give his life and to pay the ransom for our sins. And I'm grateful for that sacrifice. I'm grateful for his life that he willingly laid down. But I'm also glad for Sunday morning. I'm also glad that when the devil thought he had won, he thought that he had the victory. He was buried on Friday. Ain't no word came on Saturday. Pretty much he dead. I ain't heard nothing. I, I, I went and peeked in the tomb. I seen me still in there. Ain't nothing going on. But Sunday was still on the way. And it lets us know that those women got up early that Sunday morning. And they were headed out there to, to the tomb with burial spices. They were going to a not the body of Jesus, but they got there and they found that the tomb was empty. He had arisen. He had ascended back into heaven. And I'm so glad that now he's seated at the right hand side of God making intercession on our behalf. He came that you might have life and he came that you might have that life more abundantly. Take advantage of what has been offered to you through the sacrifice of Christ. As I already stated, whosoever will, you can come to Jesus. Whoever you are, wherever you are, it is the same for everybody. Come by hearing this word, believing the same, repenting of your sins, confessing Christ as your Savior, being buried with him in baptism. Have your sins washed away, eradicated, done away with, never to come up before you in this life, neither the life that is to come. And the Lord himself, will add you to his body. When God puts you in, can't nobody move you. You'll be added to his body, and you remain faithful unto death, and you'll receive a crown of life that will never fade away. If you're already a Christian, you desire prayer, you stand in the need of prayer, don't neglect this opportunity to receive, because the prayers of the righteous still avail as much. You have that opportunity today, as together we stand and sing the song of invitation. In this so sinful world, my time is running out, and the devil won't quit. He's trying to blind my eyes to the light of my life, but something is sustaining me. Deep down within my soul, God's word is in control, and I know it won't be long till He comes and takes me home. I gotta get.